Okay, hello everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you guys for being here and thanks for being on time. Uh, today we're gonna talk about tropical fruit with attitude and we'll talk about it in one second what that means. But before we do, wanna welcome you to Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. Uh, today there's our subject and next, in two weeks from now, we're gonna be talking about the carambola and in four weeks from now, we'll talk about fertilizing tropical fruit. So I'm sure that will be a, a popular topic. So as far as information, and those of you that have been here before to these Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, you know I always go over this at the beginning. For looking for information, I'd like you to be very careful of where you get it. Not everything you read, especially on the internet, is true. Uh, Facebook is not a great place to get it unless you're really sure of your source. Uh, YouTube is not a terrible place to get it. It's pretty good because they actually show you what they're doing. Uh, I have a few videos there. I've shot a few videos of Richard Campbell pruning. He's got some other pruning ones. Uh, and then once you start looking at a few of those, it will come up in your feed, different ones. Um, Jonathan Crane from University of Florida Trek has a lot of nice little short videos that are really good. Uh, EDIS, E-D-I-S, EDIS, that's the University of Florida database. And it has all these different publications and you can't get your publication in there unless it goes through a lot of peer review. So it's a really good spot to find information. This, um, document I have to the right here, Mango Growing in the Florida Home Landscape, is an EDIS document, so you'll find it there. And it probably has about <clears throat> 14 pages of all information about mangoes, including in the back, it'll have a chart of what to do for each month with your mangoes. Um, if you can't find it at University of Florida, you can look for other universities. So you can search your subject and then put space edu, and that will get you to university websites. Um, I know a number of you are master gardeners, so master gardeners are a great place to get information. Um, last week I gave a talk to the master gardeners for um, West Palm Beach, and then before that I gave a talk to the Master Gardeners for the Southeast Conference. And then this Thursday, I'm giving a talk to Master Gardeners for um, Monroe County. So you guys are taking advantage of these Zoom um, presentations and getting me to come give you talks virtually. Another great place to get information is your garden or your grove. If you see it with your own eyes, you know it's true. So that's a great place to get information um, and I really think it's a good idea for you to be looking there and, and checking it out each day. Uh, now, if you guys do have questions as we go, you can put them in the chat. I'll try to read those as we go. Uh, we had one earlier, which was a two-part question, and it was, I'm having trouble growing pomegranate and getting my guava trees to fruit. What am I doing wrong? So I have a whole document on why trees will fruit or will not fruit. So I put information there of how to find that. And I'm not a big pomegranate expert, so I don't really know how to answer that question. <clears throat> but I think a lot of the things I put in the document will help you there. And then privately, Monterio said that um, he tips his pomegranate and his guavas every few months and that helps them to get a lot of blooms and, and um, small and fruit. So put your questions there and I'll, I'll be looking for them as we go. So the topic today, when you just look at it, it's hard to really tell what it's about. So tropical fruit with attitude is any tropical fruit that has a little quirk or something that I can help you with, with the tropical fruit um, I'm going to talk about that today. So we're probably going to talk about 10 or 12 different tropical fruit and, and some of the things that make them different. So these will be things that will help you to grow them if you have them. 
Okay, so we'll start with jackfruit. And we just talked about jackfruit in the previous um, Tropical Fruit Tuesday. So those of you that were there for that should know this information. So jackfruit is the largest tree-borne fruit in the world. And you see the inside here, it has this middle area, which is called the rag. Then these bulbs over here, which are the fruit that you eat. Then you have these big seeds that are also edible. Um, that you, if you just process them a little, cook them a little, you can eat them. Um, so it's a very interesting fruit. When you cut it open, it's a good idea to coat your knife and your hands in vegetable oil. That will help you because this, you can see the latex there, this white sticky stuff. And the quirk for jackfruit is they have male or female flowers on the tree. So each tree has both male and female flowers. Some trees like Laxapode um, will only be a male or only a female, but jackfruit has both male and female, but they're separate. So this is a male flower. And the reason I want to tell you that is because younger trees tend to have only males. So here's a female flower. You can see the difference. The male is very smooth. This will come out with yellow pollen. And then the female has got more ridges. It looks like a smaller fruit. It's a little fatter stem, because remember, it's going to have to hold a big, large fruit. Um, so on the right, you have a female. On the left, you have a withered male. So the males, when they're when they've been there for a while, they just kind of turn black like this. So a lot of people, when they have younger jackfruit trees, they see what they think are small fruit, which are just the male flowers, and then they turn into these withered fruit. They think they got a fungus or something like that. When in reality, it's just male fruit. The tree is not old enough yet to give female fruit. So it's not, doesn't feel it can hold a big, whole huge female fruit. So that's the quirk, couple quirks with, um, with jackfruit. Okay, a, new, a newer sort of tropical fruit that's been planted a little bit in South Florida. I know even there's some commercial growing of this is called finger lime. And finger lime is a citrus relative and it is somewhat tolerant of um, citrus greening. So it's, people are very interested in it for that reason. And it has very large spines so it's hard to uh, pick the fruit. There you see the fruit, and then inside it has this caviar type quality. Uh, it's very citrusy, of course. So it gets used a lot for um, specialty drinks and things like that. So uh, it's a very interesting fruit, and some people are growing it commercially, like I said, and doing well because not many other people are growing it commercially. So there's there is a market for it, and um, some people are doing well. Some people have just gotten one or two trees, and they haven't had good luck with it. I haven't started to grow it yet, but I would like to. So speaking of citrus, citrus has a major attitude problem with uh, citrus greening. The other thing you're going to see is leaf miner, which you see in this picture on the right, all these little um, sort of avenues here through the through the leaf. That's a leaf miner. So it's something that's in between the, the layers of the leaf. And that's a big problem. But a bigger problem is what you see on the left here. Citrus greening, this is a deadly disease that slowly kills the roots and the tree can no longer support itself. And the way you can tell if you have this, which many, many citrus trees in South Florida do have it, I think almost all of them, is you look at the mid vein of your, your citrus, and if it's yellow on one side, but not yellow on the other, it's sort of splotchy like this, that's citrus greening. If it's yellow identically on both sides, then that's probably <clears throat> an iron deficiency. So citrus greening and leaf miners, big problems, but citrus greening is a huge problem because you can't do much with it. You're gonna have root problems, so one thing you try to do 
is, um, and we just got a question, how do you get rid of it? You cannot get rid of it once you have it. Um, but one thing you can do is remember the roots are suffering. So you can give it a little extra water because the roots are not going to be able to pick up that much water. And you can give it some foliar fertilization because it's no longer able to pick up fertilizer well through the roots. Okay, from one bad thing to another, um, avocados have a major attitude. They have one small thing with avocado lace bug, which you see the picture on the left there. It looks like the leaf has sort of been burnt. Um, and then if you turn it over, you see all these little insects. Those are avocado lace bugs. The good news with that is they kind of come on late in the season. Um, and then like right around now, and then all the leaves will drop off and they'll put out flowers. So that will kind of get rid of these insects without having to spray for them. And it doesn't really affect the fruit. So that's good. Um, someone's going back to citrus greening and saying, how do you prevent it? Um, it gets spread by a tiny little leaf hopper, a little insect called a leaf hopper. So if you were to somehow screen off your citrus tree where no insects could get to it, um, that would probably prevent the leaf hoppers from getting there and spreading the HLB. Um, but then that would probably hurt you a little bit for pollination. Okay. So the other big problem, the big attitude with avocado is something called laurel wilt. And when we talked about avocados a few weeks back, I mentioned this. This is a big problem. It's killed 120,000, over 120,000 uh, avocado trees in the commercial groves. And it's getting into homes as well. I get calls about it with people who just have one or two trees uh, and it's killed related trees, related, na related native trees, it's killed half a billion of those. So it's really a deadly disease. It moves a couple different ways. One, you could have wood and you move the wood, like you take it for firewood from one place to another, or you wanna use the wood for carving, so you take it, but the wood has these little beetles in it and you move the beetles from one place to another. So we've seen that where the the disease has jumped from one county to like two counties below it. And we know that was probably someone moving the wood because the beetles can't fly that um, far. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the beetles. The beetles are called ambrosia beetles. They're very tiny. And if you look at a penny, and if you look at the date on the penny, take maybe three of those numbers. That's about the size of the ambrosia beetles. When it first came into the country, it came in in something called a red band brosia beetle, and that did a lot of damage with the native trees, the swamp bays and the red bays. But once it got to South Florida and it got into the groves, the ambrosia beetles, other species that were already here, picked up what is the damaging part, which is the fungus that the beetles have inside of them. The beetles actually, they're females that fly around and they carry a fungus, and they carry the fungus so they can grow it. So what they do is they drill a hole into a tree, they make a gallery, and then they start growing this fungus. So that fungus was passed from the red ambrosia beetle to some of the native ambrosia beetles that, that we have here, and now those are the ones that are doing damage to the avocado trees, not so much the red ambrosia beetles. So here's an avocado grove that's been totally uh, killed by um, laurel wilt. And anything green you see there is just a weed and it's done major damage. If you don't work quickly, uh, the third way that it can move that I forgot to tell you is root grafting. So here you're looking at a picture of about three avocado trees in a row in a grove. So the middle tree gets the disease the disease can move through the roots. If the roots are touching each other and they're grafted together, the disease can go through the roots and go right down the line, which is probably what happened here. 
is the disease just went right down the line and also beetles were moving around and passing it from one tree to the next. So this, um, if you don't see it, if you don't scout it and see the, the dead tree really quick and get it out and break those roots and destroy it by chipping it or burning it, then you, your grove is gonna be in big trouble. If you just have one tree in your yard and you get it, uh, it's too late, it's a fatal disease, there's not much you can do. Um, if you have two trees in your yard and one is really, and they're both really big and they're near each other, their roots are probably grafted. So if one tree got it, if you rip those roots quick enough, you might not pass from one to the next. And what you'll see first as the tree starts to succumb to laurel wilt is you'll see like areas of the tree that are just wilted. And then the tree will completely, the trees will, the leaves will completely die and they'll stay on the tree because the tree dies so quickly that the leaves don't even have a chance to fall. So like I said, we've probably lost over 120,000 avocado trees commercially. Here's a grove that's lost a big center of their grove. Um, so the beetles, signs that you have it, you have it on the right, you have these little volcanoes, these little crystal volcanoes, that's one sign. On the left, you see these little sawdust straws. And if you look real close to right above where my cursor is, you see a little hole. There you see a little hole. There you see a little hole. These are where the beetles have gone in. So they go, they carry the fungus and they drill into the, the tree. They make a gallery, they grow the fungus and then the tree tries to block the fungus and the fungus is growing in the middle of the tree which is called the xylem. That's the wood that takes the water from the roots and moves it up to the leaves. So in that center area, you have the tree trying to block the fungus. So it tries to block it. The fungus moves past the block. It continues to try to block, 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 block. And then finally, it overreacts. And it blocks it so much that water can no longer get through the xylem, the wood. So that's why it wilts. The tree effectively kills itself by overreacting to the fungus that it feels in the tree. So if you chip into the wood, you'll see these little dots. These are the beetle holes. And if you see this sort of purple staining there, that is the fungus and the xylem. Uh, so it's a really difficult problem and we've put a lot of time and a lot of money into studying it and we're really our best thing we can do right now is just always scouting and then quickly moving the trees out. Um, we do have a lot of promising studies where we're looking at trees that have survived and looking why they survived and um, we're looking into sort of like uh, an inoculation that you can give the tree which is a small dose sort of like a vaccine. Uh, so we're doing studies with that right now. So moving on to our next tree with attitude. This one has a couple attitude, needs a couple attitude adjustments. One of them is, and this is the lychee, one of them is the tree itself needs a lot of minor elements. So uh, it has trouble, it likes more acidic soil and our soil is rocky and very alkaline. So it has trouble picking up things like iron. So it needs to be kept sort of on a, a minor element um, schedule. And remember in a month from now, we'll be talking about fertilizing. So we'll talk more about major elements and minor elements and things like that. The other thing that's making it really hard to get um, fruit with your lychee is that it needs a certain amount of cold. It needs cold that's banked up. It's not just like one cold front and that will initiate a bloom. It needs a set amount of cold at a certain temperature, sort of like a peach, but less cold, uh, less hours. And it needs that to properly flower and fruit. And we've been getting a little warmer each year, so we've been having more and more trouble uh, getting our, our lychees to, to set and bloom. 
So now a, a new major problem with lychee is something called the lychee arenose mite limb. Lychee arenose mite is a mite that's so small, you can't see it with your naked eye, but you can see the damage that it does. If you look at this picture, you see these um, blisters on the top of the leaf. So that's the first thing you'll see is these sort of blisters. Um, and then as the disease, as the insect progresses, you get this hairy reddish mass underneath. And this will attack the leaves, it will attack the stems, it will attack the fruit, it will attack the flowers. So it makes it very difficult to produce fruit when you have this, this problem. Um, <clears throat> like I said, the mites are too small to see with the naked eye. They feed on the fruit, flowers, and more. And they're small enough to move by air current and honeybees. Um, they don't really like a lot of humidity and, and rain. So we've had a, a good amount of that recently. So we've been pretty well protected. But now that it's going to be uh, lower humidity and less rain, we're, we're going to look to see a lot of this spreading. And where is it now? It came into Florida over here um, in Lee County in Pine Island. Uh, we think it was in a nursery and then that nursery sent out lychee plants all over. And then the, the insect or the, the mite went to all these different areas. So anywhere you see a star, that's a place in Florida that has commercial acreage of lychee. These numbers are how many acres they have. Miami-Dade, you have 400 acres. And anywhere you see this little silhouette that looks like a tick, that is to represent where the lychee arenose mite is, is now. So it's in 10 different counties. And it was recently, within the last few months, found in Miami-Dade County. At first it was in the northern part of the county, and now it is found um, all the way down in Homestead. There's been at least one positive find in Homestead and Grove. And if you think you have this pest, FDAX is trying to eradicate it. So contact FDAX. You can also contact me, and I will get you in touch with FDAX. You can send me pictures. Um, it's pretty easy to tell if you have it or not, or if you just have some browning of your leaves. So definitely contact me and contact FDAX. If you can't find FDAX number, you can just contact me, and I'll get everybody in touch. OK, so that is um, Lychee. Lychee can also decline rapidly. Sometimes you see lychees in very bad shape because they don't get enough minor elements. So they can go downhill uh, pretty quick. So remember we saw earlier, we saw the citrus that had sort of splotchy looking leaves where it was yellow on one side but green on the other on the midrib. Here we see the midrib and both sides are identical. They're both yellow identically. So that is um, a minor element deficiency. That is an iron deficiency. So you're going to want to be giving your lychee trees some chelated iron, a drench, at least twice a year in the rainy season. And that will really help to keep them green. You don't want to give them a lot of nitrogen. That's something they don't um, do well with. And you especially don't want to be giving them nitrogen or a lot of water at this time of year, because now you want them to settle down, you want them to calm down, and you want them to get ready to bloom. So if you're giving them a lot of nitrogen, which causes foliar growth, and you're giving them a lot of water, they're gonna wanna grow instead of flower and fruit. Okay, carambola, which we'll talk about in two weeks. We'll do a whole session on carambolas. Carambola, also called the star fruit, can definitely use some wind protection. So if you have a spot in your, in your um, yard where you have it protected by other trees, that's a good place. If you're growing it commercially, a lot of growers will have like a shade cloth around the planting to keep them from scarring. Uh, and they also can use some minor elements. So they prefer 
uh, foliar spray of minor elements and then the chelated iron drench as well. Okay, mango. Mango does not really have any big problems, anything that has major attitude, but there's some cultivars I'd like you to know about, which are um, sort of, a lot of them are pretty new. And Dr. Green, who is an organic lychee grower, says that um, the best iron, he put this in the chat, the best iron for lychees is either sequestrine 138, that is an EDTA chelate soil drench, or metalosate iron, that is an amino acid chelate applied as a foliar spray. The latter is available in formulation certified organic, the sequestrine is not. So you guys can see that down in the chat if you're looking for some good information about uh, chelated iron. <clears throat> so some of the cultivars, one is Angie, which came from, it was um, named by and sort of discovered by Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden, Dr. Norris Ledesma and Dr. Richard Campbell. It was one of the, uh, one of the curator choice named after Angie Whitman. Um, the tree is naturally small, it's disease tolerant, great flavor. It has commercial potential. And um, there were some other curator choice mangoes, ice cream, Gene Ellen and Graham, which were not kept as curator choice mangoes. Uh, lemon meringue, which was originally Pubu Kalai. Um, and it's variable in size, very early, very good flavor. Francis Hargrave is, oh yeah, I always forget, thank you Jorge. Um, Maurice Kong of the Rare Fruit Council International brought this mango in, so we have him to thank for that. Uh, thank you, Jorge. Okay, so Francis Hargrave was found in the yard of someone named Francis Hargrave. It's easily managed, it's coconut flavor, it's very productive, disease tolerant, very early, and it's precocious, meaning that it will fruit when it's very young. So here you see a really nice tree, probably eight feet by 10 feet, and just full of these nice big fruit, really easy to pick. Uh, Sweet Tart, this is one of the Gary Zill selections. So Gary Zill is a, a nurseryman who owns um, Zill's High Performance Plants. And he did a lot of planting of seedlings of mangoes. And what he did was he can actually sort of tell the parentage by smelling the leaves. So when the trees were very small, he would crush up the leaves and smell them. And if he felt like it was a combination that was going to be good. He let them grow. So from that, we have the sweet tart. Um, we have little gem, which Jakarta was one of its parents. We have coconut cream, another Gary Zill selection. Very vigorous, so harder to maintain the uh, size. We have orange sherbet. So orange sherbet sort of sticks out as a real winner. Um, it's got high commercial potential. Its season is from June to August, June 1st, to August 1st. It's a manageable tree, meaning that you can keep it small with um, some pruning. It blooms very easily. It's got excellent flavor, good disease tolerance, good size, a pound, good shape, very pretty, and stores well. So it checks all the boxes for being a really um, spectacular mango. Um, Sherry is asking which varieties are fiberless. So all of the varieties I just showed you are fiberless. They're going to have um, just very smooth uh, flesh and they're not going to have uh, fiber. Uh, one that will have fiber is something like a turpentine, but most of the ones that 
or really any of the ones that I recommend are not going to have fiber. So all these that we just talked about, there's another one called Fairchild, there's another one called Cox Hall, there's one called Carrie, there's one called Glenn, there's one called Kit, Kent, um, all fiberless, all very good. Okay, and then our last tropical fruit with attitude is the mame. The mame uh, can use some minor elements. It also would like to have water, especially when it has a crop, and it almost always has a crop because it has multiple crops. What I mean by that is here's a picture of a mame tree. This is a pantene. Uh, this is a magania. You see the magania has this sort of S shape. Uh, pantene here. So you have the fruit that are getting ready to be picked here. Then you have the next crop here, down here, uh, and then you have flowers here. So this makes this a very hard tree to prune because you're going to prune your tree when you pick the last fruit. But this always has fruit on it, so no matter where you cut, you're probably going to cut off some flowers or some fruit. So it's a real issue with pruning. You have to be very selective of what you're going to prune so you don't lose a lot of the um, uh, flowers and fruit. So that's one issue. The other issue is it's brown and you don't know when it's ready to pick. So here's um, iron deficiency. That's showing you a leaf that's got green veins but yellow in between. So that's definitely iron deficiency. And here's how you know when your mame is ready to pick. So on the left, you have a, a fruit that's been nicked with the knife here. You can do it with your fingernail as well. And you see it's green underneath. It's green, green, green. Here's some old nicks, but they were originally green. And then here's one that has uh, a new nick and underneath it's, it's orange. So that orange is showing you that it's mature and that it will ripen. So it's, that's um, sort of a trick that you can do with meme. You also do that with sapodilla, also called nisporo. If you nick it and it's green underneath, it's not ready, but if you nick it and it's sort of a cinnamon color, then it's ready and it will, it will um, mature and give you very good tasting fruit. Okay, so I just want to uh, thank you guys for coming to Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. October 13th, we're going to be talking the whole time about the carambola. And, uh, excuse me, October 27th, we'll be talking about the carambola. November 10th, we're going to do um, a Tropical Fruit Tuesday on fertilizing tropical fruit. So that one I expect will have a lot of people uh, there for that. And we didn't really have that many questions today, um, but Jorge was Johnny on the spot with lots of great information. He's sort of a tropical fruit historian, so he has lots of great information. I want to thank you guys for your time. If you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. If uh, We'll be here for a few more minutes, and you can also email me um, this is being recorded, so you can email me for the recording. If you do email me for this recording, I'll give you links to all the other um, webinars that we've done. So uh, you'll have those if you want. And um, really appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys coming, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. So thank you guys. Uh, Eric is asking, when should I spray mango trees? I don't know if, Eric, if you're talking about minor element spray or fungicide for anthracnose. A lot of the mangoes I showed you today and the ones I mentioned don't have a lot of anthracnose problems, so you don't really need to spray them for that. If you are spraying for uh, anthracnose, um, Thank you guys for all your nice words you're putting in the chat. If you are spraying for anthracnose, you want to do that when the fruit are sort of a BB size and you, you do that, spray them 
um, with like a copper spray and then you go about every two weeks, you're gonna spray until the fruit are bigger and that will keep the, the anthracnose from getting on your fruit. All right, so thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end this meeting. And uh, you guys have a good rest of your week and so good to see a lot of you. Okay, bye-bye.